So I want to start by saying that there is a content warning for this. This is very racist. It is homophobic. There is anti-Semitic content. But it is important that we talk about it. So if anybody needs to take a break, leave, please feel free to do so. So up until about two weeks ago, I was going to talk to you about a totally different topic. I was going to come here and talk about my memories as being a young person and how I felt like issues that were so important to me were only passively interesting to adults, and they had no interest in solving them. And I was going to talk to you about how I was using my privilege as an adult to address the issues that young people today are calling our attention to and ask you to take action on them. And you should. Different topic for a different day. But on April 27th, two weeks ago, the last day of Passover, a white nationalist murdered another American in a terrorist attack. And I knew that I could not get up here tonight and talk about anything else than that. I also knew that we have to talk about a new emergent strategy to fight white nationalist terrorism because is, is it a danger to our country? It is dangerous to us, and it is dangerous to our world. I want to define a few words for you. White supremacy is the belief that white people are superior to people of color and therefore should be dominant over them. It's a very stupid belief. White nationalism, then, is the belief that there should be a white identity, a white nation identity. They could all be together on their own. Also stupid. Just like a drunk person does not have to, in fact, believe that they are drunk to be drunk, white nationalists do not have to believe they are white nationalists in order to be white nationalists. Just like Christian Picciolini, who left the white supremacy movement and started a group, Life After Hate, said, white supremacists do not believe they're white supremacists. In fact, they would deny it to this day. But yes, they are part of white supremacy groups. So before we go into all of this, I want to say that I am an ascriber to the No Notoriety Campaign, which asks that the media not share or name uh, those who commit mass violence because it encourages other to commit mass violence. So I will be describing things that have happened. I will be telling you about white nationalist terrorist events in the United States, but I will not be telling you the names of people who committed them, and I will not be showing you their pictures. I will be naming public officials and elected officials who traffic in white nationalism whose comments are public. So since Twitter introduced the bookmark function, I have found myself bookmarking tweets that I didn't really have a use for. I'm not rereading them. I'm not retweeting them. I'm not sharing them with anybody. I'm not bringing up the information at happy hours or dinner parties. And up until two weeks ago, I honestly did not know why I was saving these tweets of white nationalist murders that were happening in our nation in this library on Twitter. I, I felt like a crazy person. Seeing all of these things come across my Twitter feed, I was saving them thinking, OK, well, somebody is going to make the connection. Somebody is going to raise the alarm. I thought I was crazy for thinking this, but I am not. White nationalist terrorism is here. It is real, and it is a very growing problem. Globally, terrorist attacks are declining. In the United States, it's going up. And this is due to white nationalist terrorism. What terrorism looks like in the United States is white nationalism. There have been 172 incidents of white nationalist terrorism from 2002 to 2009. That's not murders. That's number of incidents. Here's what that looks like in the United States. If you add in terror attacks or plots, it looks like this. There's 205. You add in white supremacist incidences, like ones that happen in Minneapolis, you go up to 387. And this map is only current through February of this year, so it leaves out incidents like what happened in Poway, California. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the timeline. But I also want to talk to you about incidents that you've heard of that you might associate with white nationalism, like the nine people who were murdered in Charleston. They were murdered at a Bible study in June of 2015. You also might have heard of hate crimes that happen, like when a former KKK Grand Wizard 
who was very active online and called for a genocide against Jews, murdered three Jews at a community center. It's a hate crime. Then there's other ones that we associate with a violent incident, and even though there's publicly available information about the perpetrator's white supremacy ideology, it is totally overlooked. So in the case of the Marjorie Stone Douglas shooter, we know that he talked about killing Mexicans, keeping black people in chains and cutting their necks, that he hated black people because they were black, hated Jews because they thought wanted to destroy the world, and wanted to shoot gay people in the head. And then there's other ones that get swept under the rug or just become this one-off thing that happens. In Minneapolis in 2015, five demonstrators outside of the 4th Precinct were shot by white supremacists. And if you read it, it says racially motivated. Even though they posted videos days before the shooting that they were white supremacists, they encouraged people to stay white and film themselves with guns before they shot up protesters. I'm not gonna walk through all 172 instances, but I'll name some. In 2009, a security guard at the Holocaust Memorial M Museum was shot and killed by a white supremacist. In 2012, six Wisconsin worshipers were murdered in their Sikh temples by a white supremacist. In 2015, we had the Charleston terrorist attack. We also had the Minneapolis white supremacist shooting. In 2016, the FBI thwarted a bomb attack by two white supremacists who wanted to start a race war. 2017, we saw the murder of Timothy Common. We had two men who were stabbed in Portland. We had the Unite the Right rally where Heather Heyer was murdered and dozens of others were injured. Here in Minnesota, we had the Bloomington Mosque bombing where three men drove from Illinois to bomb a mosque here in our state. And it's interesting because at the time, people wanted to get really specific about what kind of white supremacists they were. They were a white supremacist militia. They were white supremacists. 2018, we saw the murder of Blaze Bernstein, the Jeffersontown Kroger shooting where two senior citizens were murdered while sh shopping for groceries after the gunman was denied entrance to a synagogue. And we had the Tree of Life shooting. 2019, we saw the FBI thwart a white homeland mass murder plot. We had the burning of three black churches. We had a Minnesota National Guard member who had his papers recalled because of his extensive involvement in white nationalist groups. And recently we had the Poe Synagogue shooting. I wanna pause there, because that's heavy. That's a lot. And I don't know if all of you or any of you have ever linked all of these together in your mind before, but if this is the first time that that has happened, it's hard to sit with. That's its own problem, that no one's ever linked it together, but realizing that we have a problem here is quite possibly the first step that none of us have taken, and I hope we take that step tonight. I know that for the majority of my lifetime, terrorism has always been a thing that other people deal with. It happens in other countries. The military deals with it, the CIA deals with it, law enforcement deals with it. There's not much I can do. That is different. There is a lot we can do. So even though we're sitting with this heavy realization, I want you to know that there is a lot of power that we hold as people, as citizens of this country, to make things different. So what do we do? The first thing that we can know is that words matter. White nationalist terrorists are terrorists, and we have to name them as such. I wanna point out a lot of different ways that White nationalist terrorists are talked about. They're gunmen, anti-Semitic shootings, hate crimes. They're terrorists. I want to specifically draw your attention to uh, the murder of the Sikh folks in Wisconsin. Even though the perpetrator had skulls and crossbones on his forearm with the word suffer, he had white supremacist tattoos on his arms and legs, he had 838, which is a coded symbol for skinheads and white supremacists that have been committed to a number of murders, and he had the, word, the, the number 14 circled on his arm, which corresponds to, we must secure the existence of our people for a future for our white children. And despite this, Reports had to say he had no drugs in his system. He acted alone. And the FBI said there was no evidence that because of his connection to white supremacist groups did he shoot six Sikh people in their temple. There have been people who have been warning of this problem since 2009. 
In 2009, there was a report put out by the Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration calling our attention to what was happening. But consistently, our government has done nothing. In an era of policy platforms that see things like 100% renewable energy and thousands of miles of walls and reparations and free college, it is wild to me that elected officials on both sides of the aisles have yet to put forth a real policy solution to deal with white nationalist terrorists. And I will call myself out too, because I did a resolution in the State House. A resolution doesn't get us anywhere. We need very real solutions, and we need our elected officials to do that. Right now, we don't even collect data about the crimes, the murders, the instances of white nationalist terrorism in America. And if we don't even know the breadth and scope of the problem, we can't even get real about making a solution. Right now, the data collection falls to groups like the Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center and colleges and universities who have thankfully been trying to keep their arms around this. But if we don't actually collect real data, we'll never make real solutions. I mentioned the report from 2009, and what happened at the time was it came out from the Obama administration, it talked about right-wing extremism, and it also talked about the vulnerability that returning military members had to being recruited by extremists. And it was called out as being an attack on conservative ideals. And they were forced to apologize to a whole bunch of people. The task force were dismantled. The funding went away. And there was nobody working in Department of Homeland Security on domestic terrorism by 2010. The Obama administration did create the counter and Countering Violent Extremism program that was ostensibly to deal with violent extremism in all forms, but it was very much focused on Muslims. And under the current administration, that focus has only narrowed and sharpened and become much more explicit about Muslims. In fact, there were few grants that were granted to organizations working against white nationalist terrorism right before the end of the previous administration that were canceled with the incoming of this administration. Acting in the face of terrorism should not be an issue for the United States of America. We have done it before, and we are great at it. At the very least, at the very least, we should open a white nationalist-inspired terrorism case, like we did for Islamic violent homegrown extremists. And this would allow the FBI to dedicate resources, coordinate with local law enforcement, and collect real data. But most importantly, we have to support community groups who are working with their own communities to combat hate. We have ample tools at our disposal, including people who have been part of these movements that have left. And I'm not gonna get into all of the reasons why people are white supremacists. There are a lot of reasons. The people who have been there are most equipped to help people leave. It's isolation, it's hate speech that is facilitated online, it's loneliness, and on and on and on. I don't have all solutions and we don't have all the time, but the people who have been doing this work do. Defunding their efforts is not helping. So one of the other pieces that we can do is we can use our social collective power. In addition to our government and elected officials, companies, corporations, social media platforms, they facilitate a lot of this, whether wittingly or unwilling, unwittingly. Thankfully, white supremacists, white nationalists have been increasingly deplatformed, although they're creating their own platforms to spread their hate speech. Uh, but their money, though becoming increasingly fewer, is still coming to them. They are creating tax-exempt charities within the United States, not paying taxes, and still raising money that the IRS is allowing them to do. We also have organizations or companies like MasterCard that are still right now making money off of the payments that people are making to white nationalist groups. I'm sure there are MasterCard holders in this room. You have the collective power to force a company that you patronize to do something different. We cannot have a conversation about white nationalist terrorism without talking about social media. Almost all of us use social media, and it's time that we wield our collective power so that these platforms regulate the activity of terrorists and counter online extremism. There's been a sustained effort to get platforms like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and YouTube to curb this content, but where they have been very successful with ISIS, they have been much less willing to do that with white nationalists. A recent study found that in the same amount of time where they had 4,000 ISIS accounts and a roughly the same amount of white nationalist accounts, um, 1,100 ISIS accounts were suspended and like four white supremacist ones were suspended. This is the disparity with which they're being treated. 
A researcher says that we haven't seen comparable pressure for platforms to go after white violence because companies often face political blowback from the right. So this is where it gets a little bit uncomfortable because part of the reason there has been less pressure is because the reality is white supremacists are much closer to and sometimes in control of the levers of power in the United States. Recently, there was an article that came out that talked about Twitter won't treat white nationalists like ISIS because it meant banning some Republican elected officials too. Combating white nationalism should not and cannot be a partisan issue. It has to be something that everyone is worried about. And while white nationalists are in no way championing conservative causes and ideals, I can tell you that, they are coordinated and working to infiltrate a major US political party. That is a stated, open goal that they have. Public officials at the highest level of government have openly trafficked in white national rhetoric with little to no consequence. There have been far too many current and former members of this administration that have direct ties to white supremacists. We should not be comfortable with this. Chief, uh, or White House Chief Speaker Darren Beatty attended a white nationalist conference and gave a speech. Among attendees was Richard Spencer. Carl Higbee trafficked in white nationalism, calling the black race uh, having lax morals, and added that black women think breeding is a form of government employee. The special assistant to the Secretary of the Interior posted this meme on her Facebook. The Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships the man who ran that said that the black community is responsible for turning ghetto, cities into ghettos and slums and that the only contribution Islam has ever made to society is oil and dead bodies. You have things like Representative Steve King, who was unsure why white nationalist and white supremacist language is bad, and on and on. The uncomfortable truth that America has been unwilling to reconcile with is that our history is built on white supremacy. I named for you that the definition of white supremacy is that white people are superior to people of color and therefore should be dominant over them. To ignore that that is our history is to ignore literally all of our history. To pretend like people who came to this country didn't call Native American people who were already here savages who were lacking the intelligence, the industry, the moral habits, or the desire for improvement for any favorable change in their condition. Amidst the, another superior race, and without appreciating their inferiority or seeking to the control them, they must necessarily yield to the force of circumstances and I are long disappear. This is Andrew Jackson. We export white nationalism, and we have been. Hitler looked to the United States of America when creating borders and policies throughout the Holocaust. The fundamental and external escapable difference exists between races, President Harding said. Racial amalgamation, there cannot be. He'd be really disappointed that I exist. If we don't acknowledge our history with big things like when black soldiers came back from the World War II, and had access to the GI Bill, and banks wouldn't lend to them, and there were no mortgages, and colleges and universities didn't let them in, that's real and it has lasting effects. And little things like talking about Thomas Jefferson's mistress, Sally Hemings, as if she wasn't an enslaved woman who was repeatedly raped by the person who owned her. It is important that we know our history, because if we don't know our history, we cannot go forward and change. Reconciliation has often been a tool that countries use to make sure that they never repeat their past. We made Germany do it after the Holocaust. South Africa did the same thing. America never has. And it is the ground in which we allow white supremacist ideology and ultimately terrorists to thrive. So we can't keep pretending that people who are trafficking in white nationalism aren't doing it. It's not partisan to call it out. We're trying to make a difference. Too often we wait for the most extreme rhetoric to say that that is bad. No more. When people talk about massive demographic changes threatening our country, they are trafficking in white nationalism. When people call immigrants invaders, they are trafficking in white nationalism. When they warn of replacement or white genocide, they are trafficking in white nationalism. So what do we do from here? How can you be hopeful after this entire long presentation? Do you guys remember when you were gonna go back to school 
And you'd be like, okay, this year, I'm gonna do all of my homework, I'm gonna write all of my papers, I'm gonna show up to class every single day and on time, I'm gonna do the extra credit, I'm gonna write my papers in advance, multiple drafts, have everybody look at them, I'm gonna be a great student this year. It never went that way. And it's because we are imperfect people striving for perfect ideals. And that is how I think of our founders. They were imperfect people who were striving for more perfect ideals. It is how the same people who enslaved my ancestors wrote the document that ensured their freedom. We are imperfect people striving for more perfect ideals. And it's at times like these in our history, in our world, where we are called to be more than just individuals, where we are called to be more than just passively upset by the things that are happening. So I have faith and confidence that things can change because one, we have to name the problem and I think maybe after tonight we will. But two, that we can wield our collective power to make things differently. And I have faith in that because of literally one thing, a document that was written to not recognize me or my marriage or my parents or my parents' marriage, but yet I exist. It's the Constitution. The preamble of the Constitution literally gives me hope. It says, we the people of the United States, in order to for, for, form a more perfect union, to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty in ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. I don't even need more than those first three words. How do we combat white nationalist terrorism? It's we the people. Thank you.